I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've run over 25 startups, four turnarounds. I've written six books, taught for the Wharton School uh, for 10 years, and I have a few businesses right now that I'm running. I have a marketing communications business called Kramer Communications. I have a business where I consult with family businesses called Stress-Free Family Business. I know that's an oxymoron, but uh, people all uh, want to aspire to having a stress-free family business. I also am the executive director of the Private Investors Forum. Uh, we bring together entrepreneurs who are looking for capital with angel investors, and we work with entrepreneurs from 20 to 30 countries every year, and we have been doing it for 22 years, and I've been running this organization, which I originally started back in 1990 for the past 11 years. I write a national column for American City Business Journals on entrepreneurship, and I have a program myself called The Best Business Minds, where I interview every week different business book authors. Okay, so let's get started now. I have an email from Lindsay Grifka, and Lindsay asks, Hi Mark, will you please give me feedback on my elevator pitch and on my statements? My vision, to remove stereotypes and promote uh, self-expression and confidence. Mission, to offer innovative, chic personal storage containers that are high fashion, functional, and discreet. Thanks in advance. Elevator pitch, bling blunts keeps you stylish and you weed fresh by functioning, offering functional designer storage containers that complement your unique style. Are there any resources you could point me to to tighten this up? Well, first of all, Lindsay, I do run something called Pitch to Me First, where I review people's PowerPoint presentations and business plans. But let's start off with, you're not telling us in the beginning what's the problem that you're solving or what the opportunity is you're going after. You know, people invest in opportunities or problems, but mostly problems is what they're most interested in putting money into. But let's say you're not trying to raise any money at all and, and what you're interested in doing is just building this business for yourself. So you have to take a look at how many really competitors are out there for this particular business and then tell us you know, how you're gonna be different because that's how you're gonna market yourself is how you're truly different because there are all kinds of containers out there and I looked up the word containers and there are some cool design containers. Now, mind you, people do need these containers to put all away all the junk that they've accumulated over time. But again, it's good for you to be able to outline to even buyers what's the problem that you're solving for them and what's unique. Because having vision, usually vision is something that you're sharing with not just the buyers out there, but people who work for you. And your vision is to promote stereotypes and promote self-expression and confidence. So I don't know if a container does that for people, but one of the things you could find out is if you went and surveyed people and find out, does that make a difference to them? Do they really think of that as something that will change for them? And mission to innovate chic personal storage containers that are high fashion, functional, and discreet. I, I, I like the uh, mission about being innovative and that it's cool, but if it's storage, how many people actually see it unless it's one of those things that uh, the storage containers that you have around your apartment because you don't have enough space and you want, and when people come into your apartment, it's kind of part of the decoration. So if you were gonna do it, I would definitely show pictures of what this would uh, look like uh, when you uh, go to market it in environments that it would be used in. So if you have additional questions for me, please feel free to email me at uh, mark uh, I'm sorry, at mkramer at pitchtomefirst.com. That's mkramer at pitchtomefirst.com. Okay, uh, Edwin Darris asked the question, Hello, Mark. I'm looking to get money transmitter license in Maryland and Virginia next year. On the application, it says I need to submit three years of audited financial statements. My CPA said he doesn't do this service. Have you ever had audited financial statements and what should I look for when choosing a company to obtain this type of service? And when it surprises me that your accountant, who is a CPA, wouldn't do audited financial statements. That being said, uh, if you haven't, if this is a new business and you have nothing to audit for the last three years, 
then I, I, I think you need to let them know that. But let's say this is an ongoing business. What you might do is contact a big regional accounting firm, not a national accounting firm because they're too expensive to use, but regional accounting firms usually always have an audit practice and the audit practice is different than the people who are actually doing the accounting work for you. So maybe your accountant all he does is do the bookkeeping type of work and he do actually doesn't do audit. So mm -hmm. that would make some sense to me. Okay. Uh, David uh, Fitzmaurice. David asked the question, uh, I have products ordered from my e-commerce store and I determine the price of how much it is going to cost me to send one clothing set with packaging, labels, and postage. It will cost around 25 euros. How much do you think I should be selling sets for? I can make a good profit. I'm looking at my competitors and they're selling for between 50 and 60 euros. I think it's too low and was thinking about 80 to 100 euros. All right, so here's what you need to be thinking about is, you need to do a spreadsheet that says where all your costs are gonna be before you actually offer the price. So you do know the price of shipping is 25 euros. So now what you need to do is take a look at how much is it gonna cost me to actually manufacture the, uh, the product? How much time am I spending marketing and selling the product? How much are my marketing tactics costing me to do it? How much does each transaction cost uh, for me to do? So credit card transaction, however uh, you're doing it. So you have to put together all of your expenses and then you're gonna be able to arrive at a cost also factoring in how many of these can you order? You know, some, some of your competitors may be order, um, ordering 10,000 of this product. And so their cost per product is much lower, but you might be only ordering 500. So that would uh, vary what you're gonna charge because your costs are gonna be much higher. But also, what if you have a premium product? What if your design is really cool? What if, what if your product has more benefits, more attributes to it? So then you might be able to charge a much higher price for it. So I guess it's hard to say in, unless I actually looked at the product, but what I would say to you is figure out all the costs are going into it. That means the receptionist who takes the call or the customer service people. All of those things have to be factored in before you can arrive at a price and then how many of these pieces you're actually um, having manufactured before you actually sell it and that's also going to determine the price. Gaber, uh, I think it's Race, asked the following question. As I'm building my team and delegating more, I'm struggling to find the balance between spending time training employees, helping them be more productive, reviewing their work on one hand, working on the task I consider my own responsibility on the other. Could you share any tips on finding the balance to maximum uh, the pr maximizing the productivity of the team as a whole. I think every entrepreneur struggles with this because in the beginning you're doing all the functions and you also feel like only I can do them all right. And you also kind of miss doing some of the functions because it, it gives you a sense of accomplishment, but now you've got to be able to delegate more. So what you need to look to do is figure out what's the most efficient use of your time and the skill sets of all the people around you and who was best to do what particular function. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to put together a chart and I list all the people who are doing, uh, who have different capabilities and I list all of their skill sets. They have another chart and a process that shows everything that we're going to go through and figure out who should do what in the process. So once I figure those things out, then I can figure out where I need to shore up my team and what I need to do to get involved. Most times the best thing for the uh, founder entrepreneur to do is be out there marketing and selling because at the end of the day, you need product sales and you're the best advocate for that. So you need to hire smart. You need to hire experienced people in the beginning. A lot of entrepreneurs try to go the least expensive route by hiring people with not a lot of experience because they cost less. But truthfully, that actually ends up costing you a lot more money because you've got to train those people. Experienced people work great in entrepreneurial environments because they can pick up the ball and run with it. So you've got to see what kind of team that you're putting together, and then you've got to figure out 
how all these people play a role in the process, and then figure out from that what's the part that you could take up that won't take up your time away from product sales, marketing, and even developing the next uh, level of product. The next question comes from Ra Hale. Uh, Ra uh, asked the question, the main reason I'm leaning towards this direction, oh, I'm currently exploring opportunities to do a business with the government as a woman-owned small business contractor. The main reason I'm leaning towards this direction is because I've spent the last seven years working for small and native-owned government contractor businesses, and I have an in-depth knowledge of the environment. Since I was fortunate enough to hold versatile positions in the companies, which provides me more learning. Never thought I'd be inclined to start my own government contracting business, but thought, why not, since I already have good experience and know many of the variables. My questions are, what are other variables, variables I should be looking into before getting my feet too wet? Well, I think the first variable you got to look at is how many competitors are out there in the government space that you're trying to provide uh, your product or service to. And so I think that's very important to do. And um, do you have the capital to go and be able to deliver whatever you're going to be delivering? So if it's a service, maybe it's just you in the beginning or you and some people that you've put together that are all going to work based on you getting a contract and then you're able to fund them because that way you don't have to carry their salaries and benefits. Maybe you're also 1099ing people using subcontractors to help you uh, do this particular business. So uh, how do I make sure that my decision is in alignment with my goal and mission and I'm not jumping in because I'm familiar with the business? Well, I think you have to have a passion for what, what you want to do. And I don't know uh, that you, I don't know your goal and mission except for the fact that you would like to enter a government contracting business and you're entering as a, I think it says here, a Native American. And I'm not sure if, and a woman owned uh, business. And I think there's a good, there's a lot of opportunity at the local, state, and federal level for women contractors. Uh, there are plenty of those kinds of opportunities. But of course, there are other people out there as well. What questions do I need to ask before jumping in? So, as I mentioned before, I think you need to put together a spreadsheet and list all the different types of expenses that you think you're going to incur for this. And also take a look at how many contracts have been offered in the past for what you do. And take a look at the past six months to a year. And take a look at all the contracts that are offered, ones that you think you're qualified for. Total up the amount of money that's available. So let's say you're just going after federal contracts. Then you might take a look on the website for federal contracts and see what's been rewarded in the past and see if there's a big enough market for you. Let's say that you're gonna do contracts, but you're gonna stay within your uh, lo uh, local area or your region or your state, and you're not going beyond that. Take a look at what contracts have been offered there. Contact the offices that actually put those contracts out and ask them what's going to be on the horizon so you can determine if there's a big enough market for them and ask them who are, uh, what other women-owned companies are competing for those contracts. Because what you might find out is that there's nobody competing for these contracts. No other women uh, startup companies in this particular space, which gives you a definite uh, advantage and which means that they're going to have to take a piece of those contracts and, and put those into your hands based on the fact that you're also qualified to handle those particular contracts. Another question you have, uh, to successfully build a woman-owned business and get an expert authority by continuing to provide service that my company does, does, but at a higher level, working with the government and will keep me generating money, build my portfolio network, this will turn an added value to my mission of inspiring dreamers before go-getters then ultimately help me go into speaking world and spread my message in a more tangible way as an expert. So one of the things I would suggest to you also if you want to go into the speaking area is um, you need to first get a lot of success here, get a lot of publicity uh, through the media that tells people that you've had this kind of success and then I would kind of start locally by speaking at Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, and Chambers of Commerce. 
rotaries are constantly looking for speakers because every week they have a different uh, breakfast or lunch or dinner. And so they're, and they do it all year round, all 52 weeks of the year. So they're looking for those kinds of speakers. And it's a good way for you to practice. And I would join a speakers organization that you could uh, work on your delivery and your communication style. And then maybe beyond that, I might get a professional who will work with me, but make sure you get a professional who doesn't make you come across as insincere and plastic that you come across as authentic. So that's really important for you. Next question is from Ariel Mejia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, my business will be a free software app that focuses on helping users pay off debt in a variety of ways. My team will soon have a mock-up of the app and I want to figure out the best way for us to get the most valuable feedback. Should I focus on a small group to survey at first to give us feedback and then survey a larger audience after we've made some changes? Or should I just try to get feedback from as many people as possible right away so that we can get a good idea of what people want to see for the future? So I agree with your two-step approach. Start with a small group, but make sure it's people who will always give you an honest and direct answer. And also get people who would actually use this product. You know, somebody who is never going to use this product is not going to be as helpful to you as somebody who actually has these particular problems. So find people that would give you an honest uh, answer and start making changes. I'm actually working on a project, uh, a product myself, and it's called Funding Organizer, and it's to help people apply for bank loans. And the first thing I did was I actually went to small businesses who were applying for bank loans and had applied for bank loans in the past and had that experience and asked them to take a look at what I was doing, all the questions I was asking, anything I might be missing. And so that was my first group I went to. And they gave me great feedback about how the structure should be. Then the second group I went to were bankers who would actually be utilizing this product and find out, are there any questions I missed? And it turns out that there were some questions, even though I've done a lot of bank loans, that I totally forgot to ask. Some of them were obvious questions. So now from that point, I went to the people who would actually use it, another group who would recommend it, and now I'm going to do a, uh, a pre-launch and have a lot of different people. I'm going to look for over 100 people because I want to do something at Wharton we call a conjoint survey where I get 100 users, get their feedback. 100 as good as 1,000. So then I'll get their feedback and then I'll be ready to do a launch. And know this, whatever you do, half of what you thought about was wrong. And when you actually do launch the product, things are absolutely going to go wrong because you're just in the beginning of it. You have uh, your people have programmed it and there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be times it goes down. So be prepared to know that that's going to happen. And you want to do a soft launch in the beginning to get all the kinks out of it. So you might spend the first six months doing these small surveys, doing uh, a launch with some people and then doing a bigger launch. And then once it runs smoothly, then you're gonna go full speed ahead and larger to a larger audience. But I'm sure by the time you actually do that, you're gonna make some significant adjustments in your product and how it works. I, I once had a venture uh, called Prompt Payment and it was reverse factoring. And we spent a lot of money developing a process that we thought was perfect. Uh, and we had talked to some different people about before we developed it, but we didn't talk to enough end users and we spent like $250,000 and found out we got it all wrong. Because when we actually went to offer it, the people said, this is great, but we want to do it this way. And it turned out the people who were willing to buy and use the product all wanted to do it the same way. The way we thought about doing it, which made logical sense to us, was totally wrong. So you go in with preconceived notions and you're going to find out you're going to learn a lot by testing and making sure that you get people who just don't tell you what you want to hear, but will give you the honest answer. Alicia Thomas. Uh, Hi, Mark. I'm building a company that sells hair extensions for women. I'm really trying to figure out how to develop a marketing strategy for my business. I'm, a very, I'm in a very competitive industry with lots of bigger companies. I'm trying to stand out and create my niche. How can I do that? Well, the first question, and you have a series of questions here about this, but the first thing you need to do is do a competitive analysis 
of your other of your other competitors and determining if the benefits are the same or better than what you're offering or could you offer uh, better benefits to them so maybe with the hair extensions, some of the extensions may fall apart very easily after a short period of time or after so many uses but in your particular case you have a product that you can guarantee will be good for a number of years and you're going to give a money back guarantee if it doesn't work you might also have more different colors of and variations of your particular product for more different types of uh, women so you might not be just catering to young women but you might be catering to women uh, throughout the life cycle of somebody so that would be good to know and a good way for you to compare yourself uh, to other people what resources would you recommend and would you recommend hiring someone to help me with this so I always think it's good to get an expert that has done this before so you don't have to reinvent the wheel I also think it's good to get people who understand your industry and maybe form an advisory board maybe five people who could give you feedback on what they think is the best way to market it who are the right contacts to get your product into stores or how to or if there's online uh, marketplaces for your product which ones uh, are the best for those what's the best messaging so you might hire somebody who does marketing and ask them and especially somebody who understands uh, women uh, to help you market with this I think for myself I would not be a good person to help you uh, market this because they really don't understand this market so you really need to get somebody who's sold into this market and and is an out-of-the-box thinker because if there's a lot of competitors out there you're all probably doing the same thing you're all probably trying to get up high in the search engine you're all probably showing videos you're all probably showing pictures so that person has to um, think about what's the best way to go and sell this that nobody else has done before or very few people have done before so again I would take a, as an early step here which is to go and get an advisory board of people who have either sold this type of product use this type of product or are marketing this type of product and then I would also maybe find a consultant that would help you especially if you're not good at marketing strategy and implementation or you could do the implementation but they'll develop the strategy uh, for you uh, what resources would you recommend uh, I don't have a super large budget so I'm bootstrapping right now thanks so much um, I think every entrepreneur for the most part does a lot of bootstrapping so and a lot of people are glad to come on your advisory board just for maybe giving them samples of the product or maybe you'd give them some stock if you're thinking this is going to become a national company that they'll get some stock and they'll own it over a period of time but you're going to find there's a lot of people will be willing to offer you free help and free advice um, because you're a startup company and you might contact small business development centers in your area uh, you might contact SCORE uh, in your area uh, the Society of um, senior level executives they're retired executives and most of them are retired but they're not that far removed from the marketplace and some of them still have ongoing businesses so they could be helpful to you Emily Townsend asked the question they uh, I sell paralegal services to attorney firms I just hired a sales coach so I can start expanding my sales as I'm building out my plan in order to grow what are some of the things you recommend to balance cash flow as I'm hiring while on a limited budget I know there's a great opportunity with what I'm doing but I want to make sure I'm taking into consideration all things so I can balance the growth and cash flow thanks you asked the right guy this question and the reason I say that is because I did the marketing uh, in my region of the country Philadelphia with a company that actually offers paralegal services so typically what uh, this person they built a fantastic business they have 17 people working for them they only bring in people on a 1099 contract uh, so they can so they know that the contract is going to pay for this so from a cash flow perspective they're never in a negative number the only real cost that they had were marketing and frankly we found that none of the marketing tactics that we took and we did everything from search engine optimization to uh, running ads to sponsoring events to doing email uh, marketing campaigns 
What we really found out works the best is just networking at bar association events, developing uh, relationships with attorneys. And, and then from that, some of those attorneys started to give you business and then you'll be able to do it from there. So to answer your question, you, you don't have to ever be in a negative um, number or be in a cash flow restrained position except for yourself because as you, you need to get business in the pay for yourself, but you're only gonna bring people on when you have too much business to handle yourself. So the woman who founded this particular company and maybe if you're in another region of the country, not Philadelphia, I can make an introduction for you and see if she'd be willing to uh, mentor you uh, in starting this. Maybe even take an equity piece into your business if that's what you're looking for. But she essentially did as many of these jobs as she could herself until she had too many jobs that she could handle. And then she brought on one person, then she brought on another person. But she made sure she kept it cash flow flexible by the fact that she didn't hire them as full-time employees. What she did was kept them as contractors and brought them in as needed. Staus Sinicki. Uh, uh, my business partner and I started a craft brewery, uh, brewery tour business here in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. We have one bus and lots of relationships with local breweries and distilleries. I am sure my brother-in-law would love to go on this tour. So you're gonna to have to send me information about this tour business because he loves every type of beer. We are wanting to expand our service and revamp our business model and even take a look at rebranding. As we are building our business plan, while things are still brewing, no pun intended, with our business, we are still trying to determine exactly all the different products and services we're offering. Do you think we should focus just on one thing and try and scale that? Or do you think lots of irons in the fire and see what ones get hot? So the first thing is, I don't know that you need to rebrand because I, I branding is kind of a funny thing. People think that you can create a logo or some type of image and that's your brand. All of us are our brand ourselves. So for you to keep a brand, uh, be a brand, people have to know you for something. So if I say credit card to you, you think American Express. If I say search, you think Google. If I say social media, usually you'll think Facebook first. So they became brands because they became known for something and people go and purchase, uh, purchase or use the service because they heard of it. Same with restaurants. We as people have our own personal brands. You know, my personal brands, I'm an entrepreneur. So people know me as an entrepreneur. They don't know me as a doctor or lawyer, but they know me as that. You have your own personal brand, but for your business, if you have a, a name that's easily understood about what you're offering, that's a good thing. So it might be, you know, Kentucky um, Brew Tours. Now everybody knows it's in Kentucky and it's touring breweries in, in Kentucky. So people will know that. So I'll know that you, I don't know the name of your brand, but keeping it simple and easily understood. And when people do searches on the internet and they type it in Kentucky Brewer Tours, and all of a sudden your name comes up first because you've got this great name, or maybe you're using multiple names and have just one corporate name. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go about doing it. And I would start with being good at one thing first and then adding things on. I'm interviewing John Chambers, uh, who built Cisco Systems. And John Chambers uh, wrote a book called Connect the Dots, and it's a great book. And I'm interviewing him Monday on the best business minds. And John said the best thing, the thing, the mistake that entrepreneurs typically make is they get ahead of themselves. They don't go and, and make sure they're able to execute one thing well first. They start going in a lot of different divergent paths and don't execute any of those things well. Even in sports, the great Vince Lombardi said, we only need a few plays, but do those plays particularly well. And if I do those plays well, we can succeed. It's when we overcomplicate things that make it more difficult. So start with one thing first, get it done well. And if, and if let's say that that thing is not working out well in terms of uh, buyer interest, then you'll pivot to something else, but you'll still be starting out with that one thing and doing that well, and then you're able to add things on. Uh, at this stage, we're really trying to figure out what products and services can scale to different states, and we're trying to figure out 
how we will know that when it happens. So if you're gonna go into different cities and you start doing an email marketing campaign or maybe a Facebook campaign because you can drill down by region or a Google uh, campaign, another area you can do drill down by region, then you're gonna find out what works well. And by the way, different regions work differently. And so you probably, if you're from Kentucky, you know the culture down there, but the culture in Philadelphia is different. The culture out in Los Angeles is different. So you have to understand the culture and it's good to talk to people in those areas. And, and people who are good to talk to in those areas are the people in economic development. So in every county in the United States, there is an economic, uh, economic group that helps promote that particular region. And they have people who understand the vast uh, majority of businesses in that particular region because they're providing them with grants and loans and so forth and trying to lure other companies in and telling them about the businesses that already exist there that they might want to avail themselves. And yours is a very cool business. In fact, economic development people would definitely want to know about your business because it's an attraction like a sports team is an attraction like in a museum is an attraction. So I think you have a very cool business there. Natasha Savari is the next question. I have a mobile nail salon business. I'm doing about 100,000 a year in annual sales. Natasha, all I wanna say is if you are in the Coatesville area outside of Philadelphia, my mom needs you. I think she's tired of my sister doing her nails. I think she wants a professional to come in. So this idea of this mobile business sounds like a great idea, especially in what we're experiencing right today. I wanna take this thing to a million. I know I probably need help with marketing plan. I also need to make sure that my brand is uh, taking into consideration all the different services I wanna provide as I'm looking to expand services from just nails, but also provide other services like massage services and so forth. For someone like myself who has mostly been the main service provider with a freelance contract, uh, contract technicians, what are some things that I need to do to build out my plan so that I can remove myself from the day-to-day -day services to running and managing a team. Is building out the marketing and driving new clients and then managing the freelancers, or is there something else to it? All right, so what you might want to do is you might focus all your time on marketing the business and getting people who want to do it. But I'm sure if you're doing a mobile business, if you're going to have a van, that's going to be an expense. And if you're having people, if you're coming up in a van and people are coming into the van and getting it done, or that you're actually doing the massages, in a vehicle, maybe not a van, but something bigger, or if you're talking mobile, like people who do massages and come to your house, then what you can do is you could be kind of an Uber for this and you could offer these services out to people, but find uh, people who would like to do it, grade them on how good a job that they do, get references from them, and then you can uh, set up a site where people say, I'm looking for someone like my mom is, uh, and she types in, here's my location, who could you send to me and what time? So then you can uh, put it out there and all the people who do nails or massages or anything that you have to offer can go and respond to that. So you can start with just your region by creating an app that allows for people to ask for this and on the other end, have people respond to it and take that particular project on. They also might uh, go and offer by pricing and then you could decide how much do I take or how much do I add on? So you might just say to people, we're gonna, whatever price you put in, we're gonna add 20% to it. Customer doesn't need to know that. And so if your price to do nails is $25, now it's gonna be $30. We're gonna keep five, you keep the other 25 or however you're gonna work that percentage out. So you would wanna start with your region first, you develop some type of app so you can scale this business up. Otherwise, you're gonna be doing it yourself and then you're gonna be waiting until you have too many customers and then adding someone new on. But if you're really looking to rapidly expand, that's what you're gonna to need to do. And, and nobody, again, nobody's gonna know your brand until you've offered it out there and it works because you can have a bad brand. You know, there have been uh, businesses out there that have bad service and everybody knows that they have so their reputation as a bad one, eventually they go out of business. But if you have a good reputation, 
the brand builds on itself. Just like there are restaurants that you go to that never advertise. You know, we used to go to a Mexican restaurant years ago that was in a strip center in a small town outside of Philadelphia. The people from Philadelphia would drive an hour to go to this Mexican restaurant. They did no advertising whatsoever. And there were Mexican restaurants uh, within that 30 mile range of people driving out. But this one was so good, it had developed a great reputation. And I think you know that for lots of things. They're great lawyers, the word spreads. Great anything, the word spreads so you don't have to advertise. In fact, mostly you end up advertising um, because you have a mediocre product and you're trying to grab people who don't have very discerning taste. But in the beginning of your particular thing, it's gonna be very unique offering this particular type of service. Uh, and you would have to research and find out if I'm right about that, that's unique. But if it is unique and you can create an app for it, you can actually put a lot of people to work. And if you're doing it now while all these people are out of work, the media will give you coverage for it. You can say, I'm starting this business to put American women back to work or, or men and women who might be offering these different services. But I think uh, there's a lot of potential there. And I think once you get it started, you might even find that investors will come knocking on your door. Well, that was the last question I have received. If there are any other questions for me, I guess that you can go and put those on the screen for me and I'm glad to ask them. If not, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. I hope I've been helpful. And again, if in fact you have any questions, you think I can be helpful, you can reach me at mkramer at pitchtomefirst.com. And I hope you have a great and safe day and good luck in your adventures.